Growing up, I was taught that there were certain four-letter words that were bad. And to say one or more of these words meant you might get a mouthful of soap or you may not be able to sit for a while. I always think of Ralphie and the Christmas story, you know, big old bar of soap in his mouth. Yeah. Now, as we grow older, that list of bad four-letter words also grows. And it includes terms such as snow or work or diet. Those are all four-letter words that we don't like very well. But I think the worst one of all is wait. Wait. We don't like to wait. Have you ever heard the typical American prayer? Lord, give me patience. Give it to me right now. It's awfully hard for a country that exists on instant everything to teach its young how to wait. It's almost impossible. Richard Foster writes in his book, Celebration of Discipline, in contemporary society, our adversary majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us engaged in muchness and manyness, he rests satisfied. Psychiatrist Carl Jung once remarked, hurry is not of the devil, hurry is the devil. I mean, let's be honest. We would do almost anything rather than wait. We'd rather do something wrong than wait, right? I think about Simon Peter. He had that problem with his mouth. If he didn't know what to say, he said something anyway, and it was almost always wrong. And we get that way. I don't know what to do, but i got to do something. And then we usually regret it. You know, <laughs> truth is, waiting is not the exception in life. It's usually the rule. We talk about having open doors of opportunity, but the closed doors outnumber the open doors. When we have an open door, by all means, go through it, but how many times do we have to wait for the door to open? For the right opportunity at the right time. Waiting when a door is closed does not mean that we're out of God's will. We might be right smack in the middle of it. Waiting for His time, for His direction. As Christians, we need to overcome hurry in our lives. I don't think we can cultivate a deep life without times of solitude and quietness. I've never known anyone to grow deep spiritually when they're always in a rush. A life lived in hurry leads to consequences greater than any of us realize, and it tends to lead to a shallow spiritual existence. It leads to superficial talk and actions. It causes us to be ill-prepared for the things God has planned to take us through. A key term found in the Bible for this idea of overcoming hurry is that dreaded word, wait. In Psalm 27, the very last verse in that psalm, verse 14 says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. We might think waiting is weakness, but actually this is be strong and wait. It takes incredible strength to hold back when everything outside us and inside us is telling us to do something. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. Waiting patiently. And then Psalm 130, verses 5 and 6, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. 
Now I want you to notice in each of those passages, the psalmist isn't just waiting. He's waiting for the Lord. He's not just sitting there twiddling his thumbs, watching the world go by until something happens. He's saying he's waiting for the Lord. And I noticed as I was studying verses with that phrase, there are a couple of other words that often get attached that I think are very important in understanding what it means to wait for the Lord. So this morning we're going to look at what it means to wait, what we do while we wait, and what happens when we wait. And we might decide that wait isn't such a bad word after all. So what does it mean to wait? To begin with, the word wait in the Bible carries much of the same connotation as it does in our culture. I looked up the term in the dictionary. It defines wait as to stay in place or to remain stationary. Now again, we often associate that with doing nothing. But we're going to see that waiting on God is not doing nothing. There are still things we can do while we wait. But there's another aspect of this word, both in the English language and in ancient languages of the Bible. The fuller definition reads, to stay in place in expectation of something. To remain stationary in readiness and expectation. Waiting is not taking a nap. Waiting is not giving up hope and saying, well, nothing's ever going to happen, so what's the use? Waiting has a sense of expectation. There is a, a sense of being ready for something to happen. The Hebrew term most often translated in the Old Testament, wait, is a word, kava. It means to look for with expectation. We see it 50 times as a verb. It is also the root for a Hebrew noun, which is translated, hope. And those are two words that you often see together in the Bible. Where you see wait, you also see hope. I wait in hope for the Lord. Now, hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is confidence in what God is going to do. Hasn't happened yet, but I'm sure that God's going to do this. I know he's going to come through, and so I can wait in expectation of the future. We wait with hope. We wait hopefully. Let's go back to Psalm 130. I had read a couple of those verses already, but I want to add the next verse to it. Psalm 130, beginning in verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in His word I put my hope. There it is. Wait and hope together. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love and with Him is full redemption. So not only do we wait for the Lord, we wait in hope. And hope is a synonym of faith. It means to trust God for what he's going to do. Usually in faith, we're talking about trusting in God for what he has already done. Hope looks forward in a sense of anticipation. Another similar passage where this is found is Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 24 through 26. Jeremiah writes, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Wait and hope. Almost interchangeable. Micah 7 verse 7, but as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God my Savior. 
waiting in anticipation, in expectation of what God is going to do. It's not a sense of boredom or despair. You know, we're not like, all right, I'm waiting. We're really anticipating what God is going to do. Many are familiar with Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those of you that uh, maybe have been in church a long time may have memorized that in the King James Version. It goes like this, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. In the NIV, it says, those who hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. Same concept. Waiting in hopeful expectation of what God is going to do. And it's really a demonstration of our faith in God. In the New Testament, Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 24 and 25, For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. There's another word that gets thrown in there. Waiting patiently. There's a sense of cheerfulness almost. We know it's coming. We know it's going to be good, it just hasn't arrived yet. And we are looking forward to what God is going to do. There's almost an excitement in that kind of waiting. We anticipate God's best is un about to unfold. So that's what it means to wait. But what do we do while we wait? Do we just sit on our hands? I mean, is that, is that what we're doing when we're waiting? I don't think so. Richard Halverson, who was the chaplain of the United States Senate, he points out, to wait on God is not to do nothing. It's not an excuse for apathy or negligence. It's not to sit on one's hands and watch the world go by. To wait on God means to believe Him when He says He will direct our paths. To wait on God is to seek His direction. His light, His way. To wait on God is to be sensitive to the indwelling Holy Spirit who delights in leading us in the Father's will. It is to listen to that still, small voice. To wait on God is to be totally involved in the process of God's leading. That's what it means to wait. Now, I think there's two things we can do while we wait that will help in this process. The first is to pray. Moses said in Numbers 9, verse 8, Wait until I find out what the Lord commands concerning you. People had brought a problem to Moses, and instead of Moses just getting a snap decision and saying, here you go, he says, wait until I find out what the Lord commands concerning you. Now, how was Moses going to find that out? Through prayer. So while we're waiting, pray. David says in Psalm 38, 15, I wait for you, O Lord, you will answer, O my God. Implied there is while he is waiting, he is praying. Sometimes all that is left to do is pray and wait. But praying helps us to focus on God and His timing and His will. It lets Him lead. You know, it's very difficult to bathe something in prayer when we're in a hurry. Very hard to do that. Prayer can be like a timeout in a game where the athletes are struggling. They're tired. They're worn out. They need a breather. And sometimes... That can be our breather. Just stepping back. Letting God be God for a change. And praying that His will would be done. Now, praying also needs to include listening as well as speaking. For many of us, our entire prayer time is us talking to God. But I heard someone once liken only talking to God 
in prayer is like one hand clapping. Try that sometime. It doesn't work too well. We also need to listen to God. In our scripture reading this morning, Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. Love that verse. I've seen it on mugs and on you know, all kinds of things. And, and it's easy to quote. There's, there's songs written from that verse. Oh, I love it. Do we really think about what it's saying? Be still. Do you know what that means? Cease. Stop. In one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, Samuel confronts King Saul, who has blatantly disobeyed the Lord. And Saul is going on and on about how he has obeyed the Lord's command, and I've done exactly what the Lord says. And Samuel says, stop. Uses the same Hebrew verb that's in Psalm 46.10, which is a very nice way of saying, shut up. Shut up and listen to what God has to say. And I think that's a really good word of advice for us, for me. Shut up and let God speak. Have you ever observed two people talking and it's very obvious that neither one of them are good at listening? You know, they're just... And if you listen to what they're saying, they're on two totally different wavelengths. You know, they're talking about... Totally different things. They're not listening. It, it, it's not sinking in at all. If all of our prayers is talking to God and we're not listening, He's not going to be able to lead because we won't hear it. So we need to pray. And part of that prayer means listen. Listen. Shut up and let God speak. <laughs> now another thing we can do while we wait is obey. Psalm 37, 34 says, Wait for the Lord and keep His way. That's another way of saying obey His commands. While we're waiting, we should still be doing the things God wants us to do. Psalm 119, verse 166 I wait for your salvation, O Lord, and I follow your commands. These are going on at the same time. While I am waiting, I am following your commands. Isaiah 26, verse 8 says, Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. While we are waiting, we're walking in your laws. There's nothing inactive about that. We're still doing the right things, but we're waiting for God to lead or to move or to open the door. Hosea 12, 6, But you must return to your God, maintain love and justice, and wait for your God always. Do the right thing. You say, but I'm not sure what I should do next. That's what you're waiting for. But while you're waiting for that, do what you know you're supposed to do. And, you know, let's be honest. There's a whole lot of stuff we know that we're supposed to do. It's like Mark Twain said, it's not the part of the Bible I don't understand that bothers me. It's the part I do. Be working on that. Obey while you wait. As we saw last Sunday evening from Habakkuk 2, Verses 3 and 4, the Lord says to the prophet, For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end, and it will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. Wait. It will certainly come and will not delay. We think God is slow. We think God is taking his time before he brings to fruition all of his commands. But we know God is actually on time. We may think he's four days late, but he's really on time. 
And then after that verse in Habakkuk, we read in verse 4, the righteous will live by his faith. Or faithfulness. That Hebrew word can be translated either way, and it doesn't lose any meaning. Remain faithful to God while you wait. Keep doing the things you know you're supposed to do while you're waiting for God to show you what's next. Pray and obey. That's what we do while we wait. And then, what happens when we wait? Psalm 40, verse 1, is a testimony of one who waited for the Lord. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. What happens when we wait? The Lord will answer prayer. He will answer the prayers of our hearts. Now, sometimes God answers our prayers differently than the way we ask. Remember, prayer is not me getting God to do what I want done. Prayer is getting God to do His will on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer isn't so much about changing things in my life. Prayer is about changing me. And oftentimes what changes is my perspective. I'm looking at it one way, and God's over here, and instead of moving God to where I'm at, I need to move to where He's at. Another result of waiting In God is His deliverance. Proverbs 20, verse 22 instructs, Do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord and He will deliver you. Instead of taking matters into our own hands, waiting on the Lord means that He will work out things in His way and in His time. And it will always be better than how we would have done it. Always. And the final outcome of what happens when we wait on God, really brings us back to the theme of this series of messages, living in the power of His resurrection. When we wait on the Lord, we are strengthened. Let's go back to Isaiah 40. I had mentioned verse 31, but I'd like to see it in its context. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 28. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Where it talks about waiting or hoping in the Lord. The idea is like taking strands and twisting them together into a rope or a cable. One strand may not be that strong by itself, but when you twist them together, it takes on the strength of the others. If you were to take a a piece of yarn, which is not very strong, but you were to wind it and twist it into a steel cable, what's the final outcome? It takes on the strength of the steel. And when we come to God and we wait on Him, we are, in essence, twisting our weakness into His strength. We are allowing His strength to become ours. His power flows through us when we wait on Him. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. The power of Almighty God will flow through us. Great example of this is found in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. Jesus has risen from the dead. He has met with his disciples on and off for a number of days. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, 
It says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, wait there in Jerusalem. Now what's going to happen when they wait? Look down to verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Wait for the Spirit, and when the Spirit comes, you are given power. What kind of power? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection power. Because the Holy Spirit who lives in you is the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And that same power is at work in our lives. Giving us the strength to do what God wants us to do. That's what it means to live in the power of His resurrection. His divine power has given us Everything we need for life and godliness. We are never without power when we wait on the Lord. The Holy Spirit empowers us. And in a matter of a few years, this little group of people turned the world upside down. Now, can you imagine if about day eight, Peter gets up and says, guys, I'm tired of waiting. Come on, let's go. He said we're supposed to, you know, go tell everybody about him. So let's do it on three, guys. All right? We're going to do this. How far do you think they'd have got? Not very. If they had done it in their own strength, they'd have failed. Without question. But they had the power of the Holy Spirit, and they turned the world upside down. That same power is at work in your life if you know Jesus Christ. That same power. Whatever challenges you're facing, you have the power of Almighty God. You have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ living in you. Which means you can. Whatever it is God has for you, you can because He gives you the power to do it. Problem is, sometimes we run ahead of God. We think we're Ford. We have a better idea. And we never have a better idea than God. But when we run ahead, we always run into trouble. Ever notice people in the Bible that did that? You know, they got impatient. So they thought, oh, you know, we'll give God a hand, right? Abraham and Sarah, great example. God says, I'm going to give you a son, and he's going to carry on your name, and a great nation will come through you. And they waited years. You know, Sarah's not getting any younger. Hey, maybe we can help God out here. Uh, how about plan B? Let's bring in Hagar. How did that work out? Not real well. Right? Saul, King Saul. He was told, wait. Samuel said, you wait. I'm going to come make a sacrifice, and then you can go into battle. And Saul waited. Seven days. No Samuel. All right, that's enough. Bring me the sacrifice. I'll do it myself. Bad idea. He ended up losing his kingdom because he got ahead of God. What are we going to lose because we get ahead of God? Not sure I want to find out. Wait on the Lord. As we wait, we're waiting in hope. We know that God's going to come through. While we wait, we pray and we obey. And when we wait we will get power to do, to endure whatever God has for us. He will give us His power to do it. 
It's not good to be in a hurry. We can overcome hurry in our lives as we learn to wait on the Lord. Slow down. Change that prayer from, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now, to, Lord, make me mature and I'm willing to wait on you. That's not easy. I mean, it sounds simple. It's not easy. But it can be done. It can be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Wait on the Lord.